Part A. In this part of the test, you will hear two different extracts. In each extract, a healthcare professional is talking to his patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a physician talking to a new patient, called Mrs. Delilah. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. What's your problem? Well, I have persistent mild weakness in the left leg and occasional off-and-on numbness in the left hand. I have shortness of breath often. Do you feel any weakness in your arm? No, doctor, but I am ambulating with a cane. Was there any history of falling down? No, doctor. I had repeat carotid dopplers and further imaging studies shows no further increased stenosis in my left internal carotid artery. Okay. What is your age? 51, doctor. You had any illness and treatments? Yes, I had cerebrovascular accident but got treated. What medications are you taking? Plavix, aspirin, levothyroxine, lisinopril, hydrochlorothiazide, Lasix, insulin, and simvastatin. Any allergies due to medications? No, doctor. Is there any history of illness of your family members? No, doctor. Well, your blood pressure is 170 over 66, heart rate 66, respiratory rate 16, your weight is 254 pounds, and your temperature is 98. Normal cephalic and atraumatic, no dry mouth, no palpable cervical lymph nodes. Your conjunctiva and sclera were clear. Your cranial nerves show mild decrease in the left nasolabial fold. There is a mild increased tone in the left upper extremity. Deltoid shows 5 over 5. The rest shows full strength. Hip flexion is 5 slash 5 on the left. The rest shows full strength. Reflexes were hypoactive and symmetrical. Your gait is mildly abnormal. No ataxia noted. Wide-based, ambulated with a cane. Status, post-cerebrovascular accident involving the right upper pons extending into the right cerebral pentacle with a mild left hemiparenthesis. Status, post-cerebrovascular accident involving the right upper pons extending into the right cerebral peduncle with a mild left hemiparesis has been clinically stable with mild improvement. For now, continue using antiplatelet therapy and statin therapy to reduce the risk of future strokes. Continue to follow with endocrinology for diabetes and thyroid problems. You must strictly control your blood sugar level, optimizing cholesterol and blood pressure control, regular exercise, and healthy diet. I am planning for surgical intervention for the internal carotid artery. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a patient. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. Please be seated. 
What's your problem? Well, I have been facing this problem with respect to tonsils for many years. I have throat pain. Do you feel any difficulty in swallowing? No, doctor, but I have got this habit of snoring loudly. Do you get sleep apnea episodes? No, doctor. Often, I am a mouth breather, especially at night times, doctor. What's your age? Seventeen. I had three bouts of tonsillitis this year. On an average, I get about four bouts of tonsillitis per year. Okay. Have you had any illness, treatments, or surgeries earlier? Yes. I had a cholecystectomy. What medicines are you taking now? Nothing, doctor. Is there any family history of illness? Well, my sister has ear infection. Rest of my family members have history of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension. Well, your physical examination results show your pulse is 80 and regular. Temperature is 98.4. Weight is 184 pounds. Your tongue, lip, floor of mouth are noted to be normal. Oropharynx does reveal very large tonsils measuring 3 plus or 4 plus. They were exophytic. Mere examination of the larynx reveals some mild edemia of the larynx. You have enlarged tonsils. You have developed chronic andiotonsillitis with andiotonsillar hypertrophy upper respiratory tract infection with mild acute laryngitis. You have obesity issue. I would recommend that you go for andino tonsillectomy. The risk may include bleeding, infection, scarring, regrowth of the andiotonsillar tissue. There may be need for further surgery, persistent sore throat, voice changes, etc. This is the end of part A. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a registered nurse explaining to a student the uses of a peak flow meter. Now read the question. Dr. Matthews wants us to monitor Lucas Young in bed six using a peak flow meter. Are you familiar with this device? I've seen them before, but I thought they're only used in special circumstances. In short-term monitoring, they can be very useful for a number of reasons. For example, if a patient has suspected occupational asthma, the peak flow meter can help diagnose or exclude the possibility of asthma. It's also handy in monitoring a patient's response to new medication, or in this case, a change in dose. In most cases that I've witnessed, they're used to calculate the trigger point for a written asthma action plan. I see. You hear an emergency department physician discussing a patient with a colleague. Now read the question. In bed five, we have Jason Burgess, a six-year-old boy with a suspected accidental minimal ingestion of eucalyptus oil. His initial symptoms included mild CNS depression, drowsiness, and ataxia. On admission, his breath smelled very faintly of eucalyptus. At the time of the incident, his mother was in the bathroom where there was an exposed bottle of eucalyptus oil on the vanity. She was distracted only momentarily, but when she looked back, she noticed oil droplets on the front of Jason's shirt as well as on his lower lip and chin. 
She cleaned his mouth and changed his clothes and thought he was fine, but around an hour later, she noticed his change in demeanor. We need to continue to monitor his vitals and watch for any changes in his current condition. He's appeared more alert over the last hour, so it's looking positive, but we can't be too careful in a case like this. You hear a nurse educator briefing a student nurse about the importance of compression stockings. Now read the question. Compression stockings are specifically designed to apply pressure to the lower legs, helping to maintain blood flow and reduce discomfort and swelling. They fit very snugly to help the body's circulation, but that means they can be rather uncomfortable, so not all patients like wearing them. So does that mean all patients have to wear them? Not all, but we encourage their use for post-op patients and especially for particular conditions, such as Mrs. Jones in bed 6. Okay, so why is it so important for her? I was told they are very expensive. Mrs. Jones suffers from lymphedema, which is a chronic condition that causes swelling in the body's tissues, but particularly in the arms and legs. Compression stockings can help blood in the veins return to the heart, and a patient's health should never be compromised or impeded by cost-cutting measures. You hear an audiometry nurse talking to her colleague about a recent patient. Now read the question. I just had another patient who works as a bartender and now has noise-induced hearing loss. That's the third one this month. It's very common, but then it's their choice to work in that environment. Of course, but I doubt they go into it with the intention of losing their hearing. Surely the employer should be held accountable. Perhaps, but it's still a personal choice. Yeah, I guess. Plus, they earn more than us with all the tips they get. When was the last time we were given a tip for what we do? You don't expect to get tips, surely? Of course not. I'm just saying they get paid very well for what they do. They don't have to spend money studying, and they still do well for themselves. Yeah, true. But being paid well doesn't justify losing your hearing. I don't know. It seems like a fair trade to me. You hear a nurse giving instructions on subcutaneous injections to a patient. Now read the question. Subcutaneous injections are given with a very small needle that causes little or no discomfort. It's important to find a comfortable, well-lit working place to do the injection. Remember that preparations for each injection are as important as the injection itself. Plan to do your injection at the same time each day. Consistency is key. Make sure it's the medication your doctor prescribed and always check the expiration date on the vial. If it is past its expiration date, make sure not to use the medication. The same goes if you see any particles or discoloration. Just take it back and check with your doctor or pharmacist. You should get into the habit of cleaning your work area with soap and water. Dry off the work surface with a clean towel and then begin to assemble your medication, disposable syringe and needle, your alcohol swabs and puncture-proof disposable container. You hear two nurses at a training day discussing a lecture. Now read the question. I can't believe we just wasted 20 minutes listening to a lecture on how to deal with patients with a fear of needles. Didn't you find it helpful? Oh, come on. That entire lecture was aimed towards a student with zero experience. I know what you mean. 
but I found the tips on how to get them through it quite interesting, actually. Especially from before you begin, like watching their body language or asking them to lie down. I mean, some patients faint before you even touch the skin. Didn't you already know that? You've been nursing for years. It's so obvious. Of course it's obvious, but it's good to hear it, especially knowing I'm not alone in finding my patients with needle phobia difficult to handle. I think I should have gone to the respiratory review on lung sounds. Part C, questions 31 to 42. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Now look at extract 1. You hear a clinician called Jonathan Cross giving a presentation to a group of healthcare providers. You now have 90 seconds to read the questions. My name's Jonathan Cross, and I'm here today to discuss the somewhat controversial topic of unrestricted visiting hours throughout all departments of a hospital, including ICUs, our intensive care units. Across the globe, in every ICU, regardless of discipline or location, determining appropriate visiting hours is and will likely remain a challenge. Traditionally, physicians, nurses, and other clinical disciplines have behaved as though critical care units are designed for them rather than for patients and their loved ones. It now appears the tide is turning on the part of clinicians to provide enhanced benefits to patients and their families by making more time available for visits. This is seen by many as a positive change, but with any new initiative, there are those who oppose the shift in culture and cling steadfast to more conventional ways. So what are the problems associated with open visiting hours? Without question, liberal or unrestricted visiting hours can be more burdensome for clinicians who work in the ICU, particularly nurses, because of the potential disruption of daily workflow that might result from consistent family presence at the bedside. As most healthcare providers assert, to navigate the bedside of critically ill patients without family presence is less cumbersome. It's this that's prompting the naysayers to pose questions like, how will open hours affect the staff? Will it lead to adverse effects on patients or staff? The real question, however, is why open visiting hours causes such concern among critical care personnel. Multiple studies have been done and have repeatedly reported no adverse effects, such as infections or unstable vital signs, or on quality of care, and yet, Clinicians continue to cite concerns about safety as justification for restricted visiting hours. There was a recent study published in Intensive Care Medicine by Gianni and colleagues who identified the level of burnout among physicians and nurses in eight Italian ICUs prior to and at 6 and 12 months after liberalising visiting hours. This study demonstrated two important findings. Firstly, there was a 10% increase in the reported level of burnout at both time periods after visiting hours were opened. This increase was seen predominantly among the nurses. Secondly, despite the increase in the reported levels of burnout, the opinion of the physicians and nurses toward having unrestricted visiting hours remained favourable and essentially unchanged before and after the policy change. This latter finding is an important one and represents a significant shift in attitude. Both physicians and nurses acknowledge the importance of open visiting hours to patients and their families. 
This suggests that even at the risk of their own discomfort, providing enhanced benefits by way of additional family time for patients is a priority for clinicians. An important issue that was not covered in the trial is the potential of family burnout. A prolonged presence at the bedside may expose family members to another type of anxiety caused by frequent interruption due to healthcare professionals who may not always prioritise communication with families, especially when unexpected deterioration of the patient occurs and rapid life-saving measures have to be taken. Therefore, opening of visiting policies should be accompanied by the implementation of a consistent family support policy, including social work, palliative care, and other counselling services to improve communication with families. While some supposed benefits of open visiting hours are clearly beneficial, such as allowing for families with difficult work schedules to still visit or enhancing shared decision-making about patient care, there are also those that seem to stretch the realm of possibility. One such controversial benefit is facilitating family presence for CPR and procedures, areas traditionally off-limits to family and friends. At such a time as CPR, for instance, it's suggested that witnessing this will in some way improve family outcomes and provide closure. Surely the level of stress during such a time on the parts of both staff and witnesses would be too much and it's during such times that families should be requested to leave. I'd like to state here that open visiting hours does not mean visiting without rules. Family member behaviour can be restricted if it is disruptive to the care of the patient or other patients in the ICU, and family members can be expected to follow the same rules concerning infection control as ICU clinicians. These are the facts. Administration, as well as families, must be educated to understand the demand that open visiting hours presents. Clinicians must also continue to be supported. By doing so, we may just usher in a new era in which patient-centred, family-centred and clinician-centred care can all be one and the same. As clinicians who are loyal to the interests of our patients, we owe it to them to provide them the kind of environment in which critical care and death have occurred for many years outside the hospital, surrounded by the people they care about the most rather than by strangers. You hear an interview with a midwife called Susan Porter who's talking about when to cut the umbilical cord. You now have 90 seconds to read the questions. Today we're talking with midwife Susan Porter about a rather controversial topic. Susan, why is the question of when to cut the umbilical cord of a newborn still so significant? And can you give us a brief history of the subject? Well, you're right in that this question has always been a remarkably controversial topic. And some new research carried out over eight maternity units across the UK indicates there's good reason for never having let it go as the evidence now seems to suggest that delaying clamping and cutting the cord after birth could improve survival, specifically in babies that are born prematurely. It all started in the 1960s. Shockingly, before that time, women were still regularly having massive bleeding at the time of childbirth and were dying, which then prompted the testing of a new drug, an injection that clamped the womb down within seconds. It was the magic bullet they'd been looking for because it appeared to be very effective at preventing postpartum hemorrhaging. But of course, there were concerns about that, too. Can you tell us more about that? One of the worries was that it worked so well that it would squeeze extra blood into the baby, effectively filling the baby with blood. So they very quickly developed the practice of clamping the umbilical cord only moments after delivery. Obviously, clamping is inevitably necessary, but thinking has changed so much now that it's a little strange to think that even in the 1980s, the only reason for not clamping within a 10-second time frame was if you dropped the clamp and had to go and get another one. In other words, it was immediate. 
And what happens if we don't clamp a baby's cord? Well, the circulation between the placenta and the baby will continue for a period, and recent research has shown that it probably continues for longer than we'd previously thought. So if you keep the baby at more or less the same level as the mother and just don't touch the cord, that flow will continue. That's how the baby breathes before it's born, so you need a bit of a transition for the baby to start breathing through its own lungs, particularly if the baby's had a vaginal birth as it's been squeezed in all sorts of ways. And maybe just leaving the baby alone for a few minutes allows it to stabilize its own heart system and also establish its own respiration. It sounds very unscientific, but it's a system that's been designed to work that way, and it's us interfering early that was changing that system. What's the standard waiting time before clamping these days? People typically use either 30 or 60 seconds, which is still fairly quick. I find it amazing that in the age of potentially sending a person to Mars, the best time to clamp still eludes us. In one unit I know of, for preterm babies, they absolutely delay. Healthcare professionals, to this day, still argue about it. The problem is that there have been dozens of previous trials, and they were very poorly executed. The trials all showed it was better to wait, but scientifically, nobody really believed the results. They simply didn't trust them. The UK trials seem to have demonstrated very clearly that for preterm babies at least, waiting is optimal. The unit I just mentioned now waits two minutes. And what's your take on the benefits? If it reduces the chance of a preterm baby dying, that's the best possible outcome. I think parents understand the logic. I doubt a parent would say they don't want it. They'd say, yes, I can see the benefits of trying this. And especially if it's explained to them that the potential harms of letting the baby go cold are far outweighed by the increased chance of survival. An interesting offshoot of this is the positive change for the mother, as it reduces what was once the norm of mothers having their babies transferred away from them, where the first thing they see is a photograph. Based on what you see, how likely is it that extended times will become universal? In babies that are born early, all the organs are still immature, and that means both its heart and the blood vessels in the brain are not fully developed yet. So one of the big problems is hemorrhagic stroke. Also, they're not ready to start breathing on their own, so just by leaving the cord alone, there is better oxygenated blood in the placenta than there is in the baby. The cord gives them access to this. It's essentially a backup to allow more time for the baby to establish its own respiration. This really can't be denied or disputed any longer. I mean, what are the drawbacks? I think change will be gradual across the board, and in years to come, we'll look back on these days and ask ourselves what took us so long 